So welcome to episode number two of Learning Electronics the Leo's Bag of Tricks way. Let's just go right into it. In our last episode, we were messing around connecting some resistors to a 12-volt battery, but we didn't do any meaningful calculations. It was strictly a, an intuitive and empirical analysis of what happens. Now we can use some simple Ohm's law to calculate the unknowns in our circuit and really try to understand what's going on. Let's start with what I call the Ohm's law triangle. This graphic here is a neat way to remember and understand how to use this very simple formula. These letters stand in for the three main units we'll be calculating. The V is for voltage or volts, and sometimes people use the letter E for this. The I is for current, which is measured in amperes. And the R is for the resistance, which is measured in ohms. The way we use this is by first determining what's missing. In our circuit with the battery, we know the voltage and we know the resistance. The unknown then becomes the current or the amperage. So the way you use this is just simply place your finger over the unknown. In this case, that's the current. So we place our finger over the I and we look at what's left. Well, we just have the V over the R, which means we need to divide the voltage by the resistance. And that will give us the current. So when we perform this calculation, we come up with an answer of 0.0255 amps. And now that we've calculated a value of current, we can use this to calculate the power dissipation in the resistor. In the context of this little experiment, that's really what we're interested in. To figure this out, we're going to use our little friend, the power triangle. We take our knowns, which at this point are voltage and current, and we look for the unknown, which is P for power. That tells us that the equation should be V times I, or voltage times current, equals the power in watts. The resistors we're using for this little experiment are rated at one quarter of a watt, 0.25 watts. So we can see already that our 0.3 watts is over the rating. It doesn't immediately explode, but operating it this way is definitely kind of a bad idea. All electronic components have operational limits, and these are usually stated as absolute maximum ratings. Because something says it is rated for a quarter of a watt, it doesn't mean that you should operate it continuously at that level. It's always much smarter to give the part plenty of headroom. In this case, we really should be using a half watt rated resistor for this application. In the final experiment we tried, we used a 10 ohm resistor. And as you may recall, it pretty much blew up instantly. So let's do the math and figure out exactly what happened to that poor resistor. So calculating all this through, we get a current flow of 1.2 amps. And at our battery voltage of 12, that means 14.4 watts, which is about 57 times its maximum power rating. So it just kind of had to give way. Now let's complicate things a bit by adding another resistor. We can add this second resistor either in parallel or in series. Let's take a close look at what this really means. In our series connected circuit, we still only have one loop where the current can flow. That means the current is identical in every element in the circuit. Both of the resistors and the battery all experience exactly the same magnitude of current flow. There's only one path that's shared by all three of these elements, so the current is identical in all of them. What's really interesting about this configuration is what happens with the voltage. A voltage drop develops across each resistor. This voltage drop is proportionate to the current and the resistance. So if you think that through, what that means is that there can be different voltages across those resistors. The main rule is that the sum of those voltages has to exactly equal the power supply or the battery voltage. So what we've actually created is what's called a voltage divider. We can use this circuit to create a voltage that goes anywhere from zero to the full battery voltage by choosing the ratio of resistances appropriately. If we add more resistors in series, the voltage just divides across all of them in proportion to their values. But the main rule still holds true. 
The voltage sum across all of the resistors always equals that of the power supply or battery voltage. So how do we figure this all out? First, we need to understand that resistors in series just combine by addition. You just add them all up and that's the total. It's pretty logical to understand that if the current has to be pushed through by the voltage, adding more resistors is going to reduce the current. So what that means basically is if you add up all the resistances in the circuit and divide the battery voltage by that number, that's how you compute the current. We'll get back to this in a minute, but for now let's compare and contrast to what a parallel circuit looks like. So pretty much everything I said is true about a series circuit is not true for a parallel circuit, and vice versa. It's like they're perfect complements in a way. Looking at our parallel circuit, you can see that both resistors have a direct connection to the battery. In effect, they don't really know or care about each other at all. So this gives us our first rule of parallel circuits. The voltage drop across each resistor is identical because they're basically connected together. The current through each resistor can be easily calculated through Ohm's law like we did before, and that determines the individual current through each resistor. So then what happens is these two currents sum together as they pass through the single wire that returns back to the battery. So this means that while the voltage drop across all the resistors is identical, the current that flows through them is proportional to the individual resistor alone. But the sum of all these currents that flow in all the resistors add together and add up to exactly the final current that flows through the battery. So how do we actually calculate the equivalent resistance of a parallel arrangement of multiple resistors? Here's the equation for calculating the total value of resistors in parallel. It's really kind of an intimidating mess. Well, let's try to break this down and understand what's actually going on. The first thing we do in this equation is we take the reciprocal of each resistor value. And when we say take the reciprocal, that means you divide one by the resistor value. Doing this converts resistance into conductance, which is the exact opposite idea. A high conductance is a low resistance, and a low conductance is a high resistance. Since our resistors are all in parallel now, they're each conducting current separately and independently, so we can't add up their resistance, but we can add up their conductance. So following through with the equation, we add up the conductances, and then we convert it back into resistance again by taking the reciprocal again. And there you have it. Now I strongly recommend that before you just go reaching for your calculator and grinding through all these numbers, you get in the habit of looking at the resistor values and try to intuit approximately what the resistor value would be. And here's some hints on how to do that. Number one, with parallel resistors, the total resistance is always going to be lower than the lowest one in the group. So first look for the lowest one and understand that that's going to put you in the ballpark. Number two, with parallel resistors of equal value, the total resistance is always going to be equal to the resistance divided by the number of resistors you have. For example, if you have 400 ohm resistors in parallel, the total resistance is going to be 1 quarter or 25 ohms. This makes it really easy to figure out. Now these tricks are not intended to replace doing the actual correct calculation, but the idea is to give yourself tools to quickly analyze something and get a rough idea of what's going on. Because if you have to sit there banging away at all these numbers, by the time you're done, you won't even remember what you're trying to calculate. Seasoned engineers do this kind of automatically. When you're trying to read a schematic and figure out how something works, you don't want to be calculating all day, but you want to understand basically what's going on. How does this circuit work? Always remember, we got to the moon in the 1960s mostly using slide rules to do the calculations. And a slide rule barely delivers like two or three decimal points of accuracy. So most of the time knowing the exact number of ohms is completely irrelevant. Now let's go back and look at the concept of a voltage divider. Recall that resistors in series share identical currents and any resistance with a non-zero current flowing through it will have a voltage drop. 
By choosing resistors in the appropriate ratios, we can divide the voltage down to anything we want. Take this example here. We have a 250 ohm resistor in series with a 750 ohm resistor. If we add these two together, we have a thousand ohms. Now, doing the simple mathematics to determine the circuit current given our 10 volt battery, if we divide 10 volts by 1000 ohms, we end up with 10 milliamps. Now, let's work out the voltage across an individual resistor. Take the 750 ohm resistor. If we now multiply 750 ohms by 10 milliamps, we get a voltage of 7.5 volts. The ratio of these two resistors has created a voltage divider. Now it's interesting to note that this would also work with a 25 ohm resistor and a 75 ohm resistor. We'd still end up with the same 7.5 volts across the 75 ohm resistor, but the whole circuit current would be 10 times higher. So if we now know that one of our two resistors has 7.5 volts across it, it's pretty easy to imagine where the other 2.5 volts are. They're across the other resistor. If we switch the positions of these two resistors, we'd get the same results, always with the larger voltage appearing across the larger resistance. So now you can probably see how this humble two resistor circuit is extremely useful for creating lower intermediate voltages within your circuits. So that's it for episode number two. Please give me feedback. I do read all the comments on my videos and I'll use your input to sort of steer the direction of this whole thing as we go. So thanks again, and we'll see you in episode number three.